everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, certainly to, to folks from other parts of the world, good evening. Uh, this is Paolo Calao, I'm the CEO of Evident, and uh, broadcasting from my uh, living room today. And uh, it, it's a great pleasure to have for the second time, and uh, I have to twist his arm to get him to come back and, and talk to us again, because uh, he was so inspiring the first go around. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Rudy Ramirez. And uh, Rudy, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me, Paulo. Yeah, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell the, the group the story here. So Rudy went on the, the webinar, of course, uh, we were in the middle of COVID and everyone was locked down and we, we talked through uh, a number of the uh, experiences he's had. And uh, after going through that, I said, wow, uh, I, I'm so inspired that uh, I wanted to see if Rudy could work with us uh, and help us out in our design center, help us put more systems in place, uh, you know, whether it's quality control or the training methodologies. And uh, I have to say, Rudy, thanks very much for doing that. And not only uh, was it really kind of you to, to uh, take time away from you know your wife and enjoyable retirement life to, to come help us uh, but also do it remotely to different countries in the world and uh, the training and development has really paid off we're seeing you know dramatic differences in such a, a short amount of time so I'm very grateful and uh, like I said that uh, uh, it's good that I actually have experienced the magic that uh, you know has made Glidewell such a success over the years. So, uh, you know, thanks again. And Happy uh, to do. you know, one of the things I, I I wanted to talk about is just uh, some of your experiences in growing the laboratories. You know, and really, uh, I, I guess what are the things that you first do? when you evaluate the laboratory just to see you know what's going on and uh, you know how do you assess the situation um well you know of course as you know every lab's different but um you know we're, we're different but the same um and uh generally what i do is i'll i'll get together with the owner and uh, we'll, we'll meet at his operation and we'll sit in a conference room for a little while and talk about what his concerns are, what, you know, what he feels his concerns are. And uh, uh, maybe a little bit of his organization, maybe some history, that sort of thing. And, and uh, one of the first questions I ask is, uh, show me your metrics. And they say, well, like what? And I said, well, whatever's important, whatever you consider important. And um, sometimes we get metrics, sometimes we don't. Um, and you know, we kind of just chat about it and it's, it's usually the things that I see that that's, um, um, in this needed some, some relevant metrics that, that people can use. And then I go out onto, you know, we spend a little time doing that. And then I go out on the lab floor and I meet with all the key folks out there, whoever their key managers are, uh, you know, maybe a, a CFO or purchasing people or marketing, whoever, whoever the key people are. And I get a feel for what they, where they see themselves in their operation, what they, uh, you know, I ask them, tell me about your day, walk me through it. And they do. Um, and uh, I ask them about their metrics as well. Um, and, you know, that's when things start getting a little bit cloudy because although they can show me metrics, a lot of times I'll ask, and those who've worked with me know, um, uh, I'll ask them, well, explain this to me. I'll grab a sheet of paper and whatever they gave me, and I'll say, well, tell me what that means. And that's where the difficulty starts. And, um, you know, the thing is, is uh, there's some, wow, there's some great people out there. And they're wonderful people, just haven't really taken the time to uh, interpret and uh, this data to make it usable for them. And then we go out and look at their operation. I look at workflow. I look at, uh, you know, where everything is because the owner will tell me how things work. And then I go out there and I see how it really works. Um, 
and they're usually different. Um, and that's not, you know, that, that's, that's everywhere, I guess. Um, and, um, and so I spend the day getting to know people. I, I get to know, uh, all of what they do. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, very enlightening because, um, the, the, the great news is, is that every operation I go into, I, I realize usually on the first day or so, and I'm usually there two days, maybe three, um, the first day or so I recognize who their leaders actually are, whether they have the title or not. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll usually kind of at the end of the day, we, we go into the conference room and, you know, I kind of uh, uh, debrief the owner on what I've uncovered and, and what my thoughts are. Um, where the low hanging fruit is and all that sort of thing. And then we have a kind of a group meeting. We'll bring everyone into the conference room and all of us will chat about um, what I saw. And, and a lot of times that's when you get, um, I love to study people. So that's when you get a look at the group dynamics. Who's talking, who's not talking, what are they talking about? Um, and um, you really get a feel for the company. Now, oftentimes when, you know, the, 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 the bosses in there, sometimes the, the conversations are different. Um, I know how that works. Um, but well, actually we inter we, we, we ran into that with your group as well. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it's really interesting because this is when things start to come out. This is when you start to see what's really going on. Um, and I always tell them, I said, don't look at me like a, you know, a, a, a policeman. You know, I'm not here to get anybody in trouble. Look at me as a lifeguard or a, a paramedic. I'm just there to help you fix whatever's hurting. I'm not there to admonish you for, you know, not doing something right. Um, and uh, within a short period of time, people start opening up. And um, uh, I can tell you, um, I, I, it's just, I wish people could see, uh, um, what happens in these groups because um, like I said, their leaders are within their four walls. Oftentimes they're just not in the right positions or they haven't been given the opportunity. And, uh, and I like to shine a light on those folks uh, to the ownership uh, to let them know, look, I'm only going to be here for a couple of days. When I leave, you need somebody who's going to just carry on until the next time I'm around. Um, and, but that's generally how I, assess a lab uh it usually takes about a day to look everywhere because you know i'm a lab guy so i know where all the bones are buried so <laughs> you can tell <laughs> yeah. me one thing but i'm going to confirm it <laughs> <laughs> it's true well I, and i remember from from my experience so uh just to share with the audience here you know after our webinar i called up uh, rudy and i said rudy i got a bit of a challenge you know our design centers are busy and with uh, the increase in digitization in dentistry, I need to put the infrastructure to, to you know, grow the business well into the next five years, and I've got to start that today. So can we start taking a look at components of, of, of the business, and uh, let's see if you can help me out. And after a lot of twisting, arm twisting, I finally, and the, you know, at least a, a few prayers here and there that you you agree. Uh, Rudy finally agreed to to help us out. And you know, the first thing he said, he sent us a a, a list of things that we needed to videotape because our operations in the Philippines. And so the team in in Manila, you know, said about videotaping all of these things. And then it was almost like a virtual tour you actually did an evaluation based on all the videos. And, and uh, when you sent us your initial findings, I was so impressed, you know. And then uh, when we actually went live on, on Zoom with the rest of the team in Manila, it was more of a coaching session than it was a, a management session. And I remember going to you and saying, just give me the answer, will you, instead of, you know, <laughs> trying to make us work for this. And he's like, no, I'm not going to give you the answer. You've got to figure it out yourself because then you'll learn. And in the meantime, you know, our entire team was sitting there like, Ruby, just tell us what the, what the answer is. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun to, to do. And uh, I think it, it explains your approach, which is a lot more 
coaching than it is uh, ordering, right? Yeah. And, you know, what, what was inspiring to me is you take a lot of pride and joy in seeing people grow. Yeah. And so after that session, uh, before I used to look at you as a technician who manages a team. And today I look at you as a coach who just happens to be a technician. And I think there's a very big difference in, in those two. So uh, kudos to, to, you know, developing those skill sets. You know, um, it, it was interesting, you know, your group, you know, the asking the answers, asking just for the answer. Um, it was so interesting. And this is what I find everywhere is your group basically took what we talked about. And because they didn't get the answer, what it was maybe a day or two later, they came with this package that was just phenomenal. And they were just, <laughs> I got goosebumps reading everything they were doing and watching it also. Yeah, they, they definitely spent the time to, to put it together. But I, I just remembered the video. We were all on Zoom and I think three of us just went through the, you're really making us work for this. Just tell us the answer. And uh, your response was, uh, and I, I can almost say it word for word. Well, if I tell you the answer, you'll never learn to figure it out yourself. And so I don't want to tell you the answer. And, you know, the, that, that was the conversation we had. So um, another question here is, what's a common problem you see in, laboratories as, as you've seen other labs relative to you know what the successful pattern would be what do you see um you know i, I guess the thing i see the the most is that there's there's really a, a loose organizational structure there's not uh uh consistent solid metrics that everyone can use. Usually the owner has his or her set of metrics that they use, but it's not something that's easily translated to the people on the floor that are, that are making the day-to-day -day decisions. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, because those, those people who, who've worked with me know that I, I've got to read the data. I've got to understand where you're starting from. You know, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, like, like anything else, if, 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 if you're coming to my house and you say, I'm lost, I don't know how to get there. The first thing I'm going to ask you is where are you, where are you at now? Where are you starting from? Um, Cause we have to have a starting point. And that's usually um, uh, what I like. The first thing I hit is, is the metrics aren't informing decisions. They're there. And, and, and everybody just has to recognize that those are history reports. That stuff happened at least 30 days ago and it may not be the situation today. So, I, I think that's one of the, the biggest problem. Organiz organizational structure is, is also a thing because dental laboratories kind of have a loose structure generally. Um, a lot of people do a lot of different things and uh, sometimes that's good and sometimes it gets in your way of growth. And uh, as I've worked through my career visiting labs from all over the world, one of the, the Think I was looked at is how active is the owner in touching every single case that that, that goes through the laboratory, and uh, I used to, to to smile when I would hear, okay, well, uh, you know, the owner wants to put their signature on every single crown. <laughs> you know, what's your thoughts on that? Don't do it. Resist it. <laughs> um, no, it's 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 real important that. Um, everyone has their job. I mean, you hire a ceramist so he can pack porcelain. You hire a metal finisher so he can grind on metal. The owner is not to do any of that stuff. The owner has to run the business. There's so many things uh, that need to be done that the, the owner just can't, simply can't do. I mean, you know, when I first started with a company with Glidewell many years ago, um, th that's one of the first things actually Jim told me. Um, and he says, Rudy, you know, your problem is that all roads lead to Rudy. And if we're going to get as big as you or as big as me, we're not going to get very big. He said, you can't, you know, you've got to learn how to manage this business. And, you know, I think that's, that's oftentimes, well, actually those of you, if you're on here watching, those of you I work with, um, I tell you that. Um, because really and truly, um, 
owners, there's so many things for owners to be uh, uh, dealing with, dealing with cases and talking to customers on the phone. It's not helping your business. It may help that customer, um, but it's not helping your business is certainly not helping your employees because they depend on you. Um, if you're not running the business, then you're putting their careers in jeopardy as well. So, you know, from that standpoint alone, you shouldn't be doing it. And that's very valid points. I remember, you know, this was early 2000s, you know, so gosh, I'm, I'm getting old, you know, must have been 2004, 2005. There was one point in time uh, we were acquiring one lab a month. <clears throat> and to get to, you know, buying one lab a month, you'd have to visit. Gosh, I mean, we had a team of people and, you know, you'd have to visit 20 labs to buy one if you were lucky, sometimes 50 to buy one. And so uh, looking at all those financial statements of different laboratories, you really get the feel for people that, you know, do a good job of running labs and people that don't. And uh, the main differentiator I've seen is people either work in the business or on the business. I know it's a cliche, but it's yeah. really true. If you work on the business, it takes a bit of time for the systems to kick in. But once they do, it gives you much more scalability. Yeah. Uh, do you agree? I, I, I agree 100% because most of these businesses started because the owner happened to be a great ceramist or a great technician and they started selling that way. And I, it, you know, that's great. Um, but they have to recognize when it's time for them to back away from that and bring people in. Um, I, uh, I, you know, this last few years, you've been seeing all these next gen owners coming in uh, and running laboratories, you know, the, the sons, the daughters, the, 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 the folks that the, uh, used to just be the little kid hanging out by dad. Uh, next to the bench. Um, and I think that's fantastic because these owners are now backing off and letting these young folks come in and they're hungry. They're uh, excited. They're smart. Wow. There's some smart folks out there and now they're starting to run it like a business. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I love that. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, and we've got a few questions here, Rudy. Um, but first, just so, uh, I have a, an idea of how many people know you or not. Uh, have you heard of Rudy before? We have a poll here because uh, out of courtesy to Rudy, I, I forgot to introduce you uh, in a way that I was assuming people knew who you were. Yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, along with that, while we're waiting for a response, uh, one of the questions posted is, uh, what differentiates a task-oriented lab versus being more than a vend more than a vendor, i.e., an added value service provider? So I'm trying to understand this question. Me too. Uh, well, you're you're famous to half the people that are listening. <laughs> Great, you know, good, the, mom. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the other half, uh, just for the folks that don't know Rudy uh, for 30 plus years Rudy was the GM for Glidewell's fixed uh, prosthetics department and really I mean when you started working with uh, Jimmy Glidewell I mean the lab was what 50 people yeah there was just there was a, just a few you know and to where it is today so that career has really spanned the growth of, of uh, the laboratory from you know, basically uh, the same lab as what many of us own to what's considered the, uh, you know, the, the largest single operation in, in uh, the lab industry today, right? And the thousands of people. So uh, and that's been a good journey really. And you guys have done an incredible job. Um, I wish I were that smart that I could have kept up, you know, but uh, you left us behind. <laughs> well, you know, um, when you have a guy like Jim at the helm, you know, just hang on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the question's, I guess, more tied to what differentiates uh, more of a commodity lab versus a value service provider. Do you have any comments on that? I don't understand the question. Yeah, I, I'm uh, 
trying to understand it as well. So for the person that posted that that question, if you don't mind just adding more clarity to it so we can give you a better answer. Uh, here's another one. What has been your biggest mistake or regret in your career? Wow. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if you have a lot of regrets. I have a ton of mistakes. This isn't long enough for all the mistakes, but um, you know, I guess there's, there's a lot of things that I, I, I wish I'd have started uh, doing earlier. Um, you know, uh, in the early days I was a, and those who have worked with me in my younger days, um, I was a work boy. They, they tell me you were a ball buster. That's what I, the... <laughs> I, guilty as charged. Um, you know, those were the, those were the wild, wild west days. And, and, you know, in, in, in many cases we needed that early on. Um, but we got to a point where it was no longer, uh, necessary nor appropriate. Um, I mean, back in the old days, I mean, that's when people would square off in the aisles, you know, and like, Oh yeah. You know, um, we've all seen that sort of stuff, but, um, I guess, I, I guess I, 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 I wish I could have matured as a manager earlier, sooner. I had the information, um, but I was pretty headstrong. Um, and I thought what I was doing was working and if you didn't like it too bad. And that was my, my thing. But I, I learned after I, I lost, well, almost everyone. Um, I learned that that's probably not the best way to do things. And, uh, I've had many, many mentors, uh, 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 who, who have taught me I, one in particular, I won't name him because I haven't asked him, but I was really angry one day and I was talking really saying really bad stuff to him because he, he gave me some constructive criticism and he says, Rudy, are you mad because I told you, or are you mad because it's true? And that hit me right between, cause I was mad at both of them. <laughs> so I started having to learn to, to, you know, manage the way you're supposed to manage. So I, I, I wish I'd have started that earlier, sooner. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting uh, uh, reflection because uh, also in, in my experience, and I mean, me, a culpa, people today would still consider me a ball buster when, uh, <laughs> when I deal with, with them. But uh, there's, there, there has to be, uh, at least in my experience, a certain amount of fire in people's belly when they they set out to go and conquer the world, so to speak. You know, that, that's what keeps them going. And the, the other argument or debate is whether, uh, about, you know, that's part of the filtering process to understand who the people you eventually train as your, your middle management team and go through the organization. And then they mature into those roles yeah. uh, as they go along. Right? Yeah. Uh, because every, everyone who said that to me that I wish, you know, I learned the, the coaching style when I was younger tend to be older because they've seen life's journey at that point and they're able to reflect. But I, I often ask if you did see life's journey, you know, how you could get to that realization without actually feeling it yourself. So uh, it, it's an interesting perspective. I, I don't have the answer to it, but more, you know, just some self-reflection. Uh, Ali at Shaw, Shaw Labs asking, uh, what's the biggest threat existential to the dental laboratory industry? For example, Netflix uh, was the existential threat to Blockbuster. What do you see as the, the big threat to the lab industry today? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of people out there with a lot of money. Um, and as our industry goes more digital, um, uh, they, they can, uh, they can take what you have. I, I actually told a, a laboratory not too long ago that, uh, there's a lot of big people out there with a lot of big dollars who are more than happy to take what you have, um, if you don't get it together. Um, and I think that, and, I, and I'm not saying that because there's, there's bad people out there. I mean, it's business and, um, the more we move towards digit digitization, uh, the more uh, vulnerable we are unless we get on board. There's a lot of laboratories out there who still just, you know, they, they argue about it and they fight about it. And no, I'm not going to go there. And, 
you know, that's not dental technology. And I get it. I understand. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ceramist. I, I get it. Um, but just like anything else, um, this business is changing. Um, and uh, we, we looked at this quite a long time ago. Is If you look at an old picture, actually Mike Cash brought it to one of our meetings one time. And uh, if you look at a picture of a old lens grinding operation where they made your eyeglasses by hand, it looked very much like a dental laboratory. Uh -huh. And today, today, you got lens crafters in the mall. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that um, the thing that's coming our way is, is mass customization. Um, and, you know, uh, you know I, I feel for the people that are out there that are having a tough time and, and you see them on the forums, they're complaining about one thing or another. And, and I think, gee whiz, spend less time complaining on the forum and work on your business. Um, and uh, things will go better for you. But, but yeah, I, I think, you know, the coming, you know, not the coming, the digital age that we're in, um, I think there's a lot of big companies out there eyeing our industry. It's still very fragmented. And um, people used to say they can come into a dental laboratory and roll them all up and run them. And they've learned that, you know, it's, it's a different yeah. business. So that's difficult. But as the laboratory shrinks uh, and the laboratories are getting bigger, well, something like that makes more sense now because they're, they're better operations today. I, I'd agree. Um, uh, just a quick poll. What percentage of dentists uh, or of the listeners have dentists that they're sending them digital cases? Uh, just to get an idea on the subject of digitization, whether you know we're talking to a digital group or not. Uh, my thoughts on that is... As far as an existential threat, you know, if you look at, uh, with all due respect to Align and Itero and the things they've done, now they own Exocad. I mean, that's a very dominant digital pathway. So companies like Align, uh, companies that are, are trying to control uh, and, and manage the digital pathway, are, are the ones that are probably the biggest threat to the industry. And if we look at, wow, you know, for most labs listening today, under 20% of their, their dentists are using digital. Right? What? Yeah. Wow. What percentage of your dentists send you digital cases? Under 20% is the, the response of 57% of the, the listeners, hmm. which is very interesting to me. It is you know. because I've been seeing digital impressions going up. Maybe it's the same guy. It's just shifting their work there. Yeah, I mean, uh, the numbers that we see are somewhere around thirty percent of dentists are are doing digital. So it actually the answers correlate with with uh, what we're seeing in the marketplace. A lot of people have bought scanners, but actually don't use them in day to day. Uh, yeah practice you know in fact they they brag about it but they don't actually know how to execute to operationalize it because it, it, it's a change in behavior patterns as, as we all know um yeah but uh, as i see it the threat to the industry you're right bang on it i agree with you on the capital you know there's so much uh capital going into the business uh a lot of private equity investors coming in certainly we get calls every day you know people want to put capital into the business and the reality is uh you know capital breeds uh innovation because the more capital that people put into the industry the more opportunities to innovate and uh, so uh, i'd see that as really the game changer in this business you know 20 years ago you couldn't get capital into the lab business because no one paid attention to it today uh people are lining up to put capital into the, the yeah, building. throwing money around now yeah yeah so uh oh here's a follow-up the question the person had is you know how do you become a partner with your client this is just a commodity provider in other words how does the lab become consultative versus just providing a cheap crown <laughs> Well, you know, I, one of the things that I used to tell customers, because I, I'd get this customers and it's funny, I asked some of the, some of the labs I work with, I literally call their offices and I say, 
why the heck would I want to use your lab? Because I used to get doctors that, that would ask me the same thing. So that's what I ask labs these days. Um, and one of the things that I used to tell doctors is that, you know, when you buy a crown from us, you buy, you're not just buying a crown. Everybody can make you a crown. You know, we've got technical support and blah, blah, blah. So I, I told them all the things that we could do to help make their business better, more profitable, and, and how they can become more knowledgeable just by pigging, piggybacking off of us. And really and truly, um, if you're a partner with that dentist, and, and by partner, uh, I don't mean you're rushing to his office every 10 minutes when he's got somebody sitting there for a shade. I'm talking about a partner where, where he trusts you or she trusts you uh, in the information that you provide for them. So you've got to make their job easier. You know, never forget, this is a business. And if I'm your customer, and you provide a better value for me by making me more profitable, give me cheaper uh, 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 products without changing the quality. Um, if you can, if you can make my life better, solve my problems, you got a customer for life. And most laboratories don't do that. It's just a transaction. The crown goes out, negative call comes in, dies right there, and eventually the customer leaves. So there's no real full circle in that. So. To me, uh, you know, Dennis, like anybody else, I mean, look at yourself as a customer. Who do you align with in terms of your normal life? Why do you go? I, 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 there's this, you know, I, I go to the, uh, uh, this, this one uh, lady who cuts my hair for almost 30 years now. Um, and it's not because it's cheaper. It's because she's done it right. I, I, we have a relationship. She knows what I like, on and on and on. Your dry cleaner, your whatever. I mean, why do you buy from Amazon? Because you can count on them. You depend on them. Yeah. So to me, um, look through your feedback. Look through what your customers are telling you. Um, because really and truly, your customers will tell you how to make that, that, that relationship more valuable. Um, and I, I find that information in every laboratory. It's just people don't tend to act on it. So really and truly, provide them more than a crown because we can all make crowns. I mean... Especially with technology nowadays, we have fixed libraries that we pull out of the design software, and then we have milling units that can mill. And you know, the artistry that's going into the crown is maybe the last ten percent of the crown has some in the individuality to it. But it's even the question of whether, uh, other than you know, the magical six anteriors, whether people actually even care for all those, those other things in the back. Right? Well, and that's the thing, you know, we as dental technicians, I can look at a, a, a beautiful piece of work and we can all talk about it and admire it. And, and it's just wonderful. I enjoy doing that even to this day, but the customer doesn't recognize it. They don't appreciate it for the most part. Um, and, you know, a long time ago, Jim uh, uh, told us, he said, look, don't think about it. This is art. Think of it as geometry. Um, and if you think about it as geometry, you'll, you'll start to think about this whole thing differently. And it's true. I mean, digital, it's not art. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, now that being said without, I don't want people to you know start beating me up over this. Uh, there's, some, <laughs> there's some artists out there who, uh, they've got more talent in their little pinky than I'll ever have. Um, and, and that's wonderful. That's, that's, that's for us more than it is for the patient. So my uh, buddy Jeff Strong is saying, I believe chair-side printing will be the biggest threat. The posterior crown will disappear from the lab in about five to 10 years. You know, maybe Jeff, I mean, you know, it's hard to tell with, with dentists nowadays because they're just getting overwhelmed with information. So if I'm a dentist, do I really want to set up a factory in my back office to produce all this stuff? Or... Do I want something that's much more seamless and experienced so that I don't need to set up a factory and still get the same outcome? Yeah. Right? And in the world of COVID, the less, uh, the less uh, factories you have in your back office, it becomes easier for you just, you know, from a physical standpoint. And uh, uh, to me, I've been a big proponent of really the lab owning their own digital pathway between uh, dentist and their laboratory. I mean, that's why we built Evident 
uh, software to begin with is we wanted to give labs a chance to own that channel between their customers and the laboratory. I mean, that's the same thing Glidewell is doing. They want the channel between the dentist and their laboratory because then you're, you're protecting your lab from, you know, uh, changes in the future. And when technology comes, you can easily deploy it to all your customers. So, I, you know, that's food for thought for a lot of people listening here is who owns the digital pathway between your customers and your lab? Because as the industry digitizes, if you don't own that, then uh, that could disappear on you with just a flick of the button. And so to me, that's something to watch out for. Uh, Fell named Tim is asking, when you mill and center hundreds of crowns per day or thousands, how do you organize the process from design where the case span model patient and doctor info are together through milling, centering, and back into the core correct case span? Like, I guess what he's asking is how do you set up, you know, the logistics and organization of all of this stuff? Well, we don't have enough time to go through all of that. <laughs> it's, it's, Fair enough. It's, it's a, a good question. Job. It's a, it's a good question. Um, but there's, there's a lot to it. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, sure when you're doing onesies and twosies, it's, it's, it's less of a challenge, but I go back to systems. Um, um, you know, one of the things that, that, and it, and it actually goes back to one of your original questions about, um, what's lacking in laboratories, because if you, in the early days, I had to keep rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding until one day, and, and I don't remember who, probably Jim's, said, look, <laughs> how often are you gonna do this? Um, you need to create a system that will grow with your laboratory so you're not redeveloping a new system every couple of years just because your, your, your lab grew. Um, but yeah, that question is a series of systems in each and every one of those areas uh, that we talk about. Um, um, yes, yeah, it's as simple as getting a, a design in and designing it and moving it out, but there has to be an infrastructure built around that. Um, and depending on your size, that, that'll determine the size of this infrastructure. But um, if you don't have a solid system today, you know, and, and whoever the, 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 the person that asked the question, you should probably write down exactly what you believe your system is today, if you even have a system, um, and start taking it apart piece by piece. That's actually what I did with Paulo and his group and start taking it apart piece by piece to understand if it's actually working. Because if your system depends on the designer or the milling guy or whatever to get up and walk something over and type something in a computer and oh, don't forget there's a note over there. That's not a system. Um, so there, there's, there's quite a bit to it. And, you know, it, it took years to develop that. It, you know, I can't, describe it in, yeah. in, in a few seconds. But yeah, I, I, I would say you just have to create some systems that are simple, you, you know, and again, when you create systems, most people create systems, I say, show me your system. And it's this complex web of stuff that no one can do, right? So it, it has to be very simple. And I'm, those of you who work with me know I'm a pretty simple about the way I approach things. Well, uh, wasn't it Einstein that said, uh, you know, genius is making the complex seem simple. So uh, it's a testament to, you know, the experience and, and thought process you bring to the table. But uh, Tim, if you'd like more feedback on that, you know, uh, just reach out to us and I'm happy to give you some insight because this was probably early on, maybe eight years ago when, when uh, our lab started to digitize was the bane of my existence just keeping track of where everything went. Oh, the minute it went digital. So we actually built systems and evidence for that. So, because when the, when the case, you know, was being sent somewhere else or outsourced somewhere or designed somewhere else, we wanted to be able to track a virtual case span so that we knew what was coming back in. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, tough. Us, it's a tough one. And, and it, it was not a long, it was not a, a short process. We had many, many days where I'd have a whole bunch of boxes and no crowns or a whole bunch of crowns and no boxes. So, you know, <laughs> it's an iterative yeah, process. It's a bit did. of a trial in there. Yeah. Um, 
Sean's asking what metric do you use for planning benefits packages for employees? How do you know if it's too low and or unsustainable and high? That would probably be a question you can answer, Paulo. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, on my end, I, I always looked at uh, one third production, one third overhead, and then one third profit. And that was the benchmark that that uh, I would use as a uh, uh, metric to, to operate laboratories. And, you know, and then you're fine tuning that along the way, because I mean, in order to get those ratios, you also have to look at how you price your crowns relative to the labor in your, in your market, right? And uh, so, but as a general rule, I go with the one third, one third, one third. Now, our business was very different than yours. You guys were scaling up and, you know, the, the strategy to scale up requires a lot of investment up front. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in my approach to the business, we would buy laboratories and then take the operations and refine them. And that was a very different approach, but that was our benchmark. Uh, uh, so hopefully that, that helps guide well, and, you. And to back on this, I, I get a lot of people who ask me, what should this number be? And really, I, and I understand that's kind of like, give me the answer kind of thing. And I understand that people want a number, but really and truly, it depends on your demographic. Where are you at? Yeah. What, are your prices? what are your prices? What does your labor look like? You know, if you have a, a family run business, chances are you've got a lot of expensive people out there who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's, that's costing you dollars. So your costs are going to be more so than somebody who doesn't have that scenario so it, it's an individual thing with with dental laboratories for sure now when we look at uh, some of the things that you've done through your career uh, what do you think is the big difference between labs that grow and labs that don't grow well um, everyone I talk to wants to grow um, but just like everyone wants to lose weight. Not everyone's willing to eat right and, and exercise. Um, but you know, I, I, I think systems are, are, are huge, um, or lack thereof. Um, and again, um, well, systems, the metrics that you use to run those systems are absolutely critical. And again, if you work with me, you know, I, 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 I thrive on that, that, that data. Um, you know, that, that's, I think, a huge thing is, is having the right systems in place that actually do something. You know, you can't have a system in your laboratory and say, here's my system. And I'll say, well, what do you get out of that system? And show me the results. I mean, that the system is showing me activity. Show me the results. And, and oftentimes that's, that's a little fuzzy. So. Yeah, and um, certainly in, in my working with you, I, I've realized there's a standard set of metrics that you look at when you walk into a laboratory and uh, I mean I'll share with everyone here between Evident and, and Rudy with Twisted Rudy's arm to help us build these metrics because I was using them for myself and uh, you know we said okay how do we automate these things so that uh, Rudy can walk into a laboratory and if uh, they're using the Evident platform we can just press a button and get all these metrics right away as opposed to, you know, spending months and months trying to build out the, the database. And uh, I'm glad you were happy with the reporting that uh, we've developed so, so far because it's real time reports that spits out, uh, you know, what I call the Rudy method. So we can get an understanding of how you see the world and, uh, the benchmarks you use to, to become successful. So that's been really awesome. And uh, what I've done, uh, yeah, a lot of people don't know this, is I've been trying to figure out how do we get the, the wisdom and experience of the Rudy's head and actually uh, apply it so that we can share it with more, more people in the world. And uh, maybe a bit of encouragement here uh, if we could set up some sort of consultation with Rudy uh, to help laboratories, 
who would be interested in that? And I think it'll give us some guidance on, you know, whether this is something that we can automate and uh, provide at a, a reasonable rate to the people out there so that uh, we're not disruptive of Ruby's retirement and yet, you know, take all the learnings uh, that uh, have been have been out there. So if anyone's uh, interested in that, let me know. And uh, if you say yes, it might motivate Ruby to actually do more of this stuff with all the free time he's got now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Tim's already responded. I would love some help. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> Can you fill the poll? And uh, that way we've got the score. Uh, oh, look at that. Wow. When I offered help, we had like 12% say yes. So that gives you an idea <laughs> that you're far more popular than me. Uh, so, someone's asking what you're charging for coaching. And I, I, I really don't know uh, how that works with you, Rudy, today. But I know, certainly full disclosure, I said to, to Rudy uh, uh, a month or so ago, you know, I wonder if we can automate all of your reporting. And then you can just coach people online and, and uh, you know, get the data you need to, to give them some guidance without having to fly all over the world to do it. And that's essentially what we've done with uh, you working with us at Evident is we're doing everything digitally. And, uh, uh, you know, he's coaching us and uh, giving us some guidance. And I can tell you, the team and the evident are so happy right now because we're seeing the success. So, uh, oh, and the one-on-one -on -one today, I guess pre-COVID, you know, what would your typical approach be in coaching someone? You'd fly there and then spend three days in their facility? Yeah, I'd spend two or three days and, uh, well, meet with everybody and, and go through, literally walk through everybody's day, day to day. Um, and then as time goes on, it, it becomes a coaching relationship where they'll send me emails and say, Hey, I'm struggling with this or that, you know, what do I do? Let's talk. And, you know, we'll schedule a talk and we'll talk. Um, so yeah, that, that's, you know, I, I've been doing quite a bit of that um, recently. And then now with the uh, situation with COVID, I guess there's really not a lot of flying around anymore. And it's a matter of, Again, developing systems like you've done with us to say, okay, let's start videotaping as if I'm there. And it's really cool. <laughs> like, yeah. I learned more about our operation in, in Manila through those videos and, <laughs> and uh, I've learned in, in like five years. <laughs> so, um, That's why I say the owner has his idea of, really, of what's going on, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's typically not the case, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, I mean, what we were, what I had suggested to Rudy is we would come up with a, a subscription service that really codifies the Rudy methodology and then offer it up to, to uh, laboratories all over. And uh, my goal, and I mean, full disclosure, we don't, you know, this is not a, a profit motive for for evident but more to help laboratories become successful because the more successful you guys are frankly the more successful we become so our our focus is to help the laboratories that are on evident uh, or the evident customers really become better and better and better so that uh, we all grow together because i believe that uh, this industry is going through what what is the largest revolution in the industry uh, in my entire career and uh, a lot of the laboratories today are uh, frankly not equipped to deal with that that revolution so you know finding a way to deliver the assistance and, and guidance to them efficiently is i i think key to you know being one of the the people that thrive in this environment versus those that, that end up uh, you know, suffering through it. Yeah, Isn't this is that a the case? critical time right now. And that, that's, it's, it's really hard. It, it's, it's a very critical time for most people right now. 
Yeah. And uh, I feel for a lot of the smaller labs, they, they ask you the same question all the time. And I, I have the same answer. I feel like the world, not, not just the lab business, the business in general, uh, is going to a musical chairs right now where you can pick any chair you want and point it in the direction you want to go. It's a, it's a Dr. Seuss poem. You know, you have shoes on your feet and you can go where you go. And I really think, you know, the world today allows that opportunity. And the problem is people don't know where to point their chair and where to point their feet. And so some guidance in helping you do that will position yourself well for the future. Whether you're a, small, medium, or large laboratory. really believe that. Uh, and I encourage everyone to, to, you know, take up all these opportunities to learn so that they can direct their, their laboratory in, in the direction they wish, right? Yeah, and you know, um, right now especially, you know, because it, 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 it's such a tough time, you know, those laboratories who um, – had a little war chest maybe or were managing their operation profitably and all that they had that little extra margin to allow them to stick this whole process out and and without taking out loans and all the other stuff that go along with it and i think it's real important that everyone gets um gets their business to the healthy place it needs to be financially and operationally uh, those who were there in that spot when this happened they're doing okay right now. Those are the ones that I'm hearing are just killing it right now. They've got records. And then there's the others who, you know, for whatever reason, they just weren't all that ready, uh, either operationally or financially. They're, they're, you know, and they've had a real rough go of it. And they're, they're, it's showing today their, their sales aren't, aren't doing real great right now. And, you know, that's, that's all uh, preventable. Uh, that's what we're seeing too. You know, laboratories, it's almost binary. Some labs are not doing well, and some labs are just shooting the lights out there. Yeah. Uh, and there's a pattern you see in those that, that do well and those that, that don't. So uh, a few last things here. Uh, for people that need the CE uh, certificate from Evident, we're going to put a, a poll up just so we know who to send those to. and. If anyone wants information on the designs, evident designs, of course, that's our commercial. Uh, you know, please let us know, and we'd love to have a chat with you. Uh, a few other things on the questions here before uh, we run out of time. If an owner has the right metrics or reports at their disposal, will the owner be able to know what is happening in their business? Well, yes, that kind of answered itself. If you have the right reports. Um, yeah. Um, the right reports. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and again, I see a lot of people that have reports, but they're just, they're, they're a report yeah. that their system spit out that, you know, you know, the owner in general, the owner has these and they're generally financial reports, but your technicians and managers, they don't understand that. They understand units, you know? Yeah. Um, so there, there's, yeah, if you have the right reports, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, in order to get the right reports, you need the right data. And you need, you know, the data to be all matching or entered in a certain way so you can pull it out and uh, have the right information in front of you. So the, the right reports are the output, but in order to get to the right output, there's a bit of time in, in preparing and, and uh, uh, putting the software and the training in place so that you get that. Is that fair to say, Ruby? It is. It is. Remember, a report is, is ideally, if a report is, is done for the right reasons, um, not just a report for the sake of report, but I, I, at its core, a, a report is nothing more than answering a question, right? It's answering a question that we had, um, and oftentimes we'll have a question, we'll find some report that gives us some high level view of it. And then we say, great, and we move on and we never revisit that report ever again. So it's gone and you end up repeating that somewhere down the line. Um, so yeah. Now a couple of last questions here. 
Sean's asking, are there any services that help design labs for efficiency and optimization? I'm crossing this bridge now as I'm sorting out renovations. I mean, I love how honest people are in asking questions and, you know, thank you for, uh, I mean, frankly, thank you for the honesty uh, that shows that, you know, you're respecting uh, what we're trying to do on, on these webinars. So I really appreciate that. But any thoughts on those services, really? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't know if there's a, uh, you know, a turnkey service where you can have some team come in and, you know, uh, tent your building and then you walk back into a, a, a great operation. Uh, but there's, there's absolutely ways to go about doing this. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we've been doing with you. Um, and, um, really it's, it's just about, you know, whoever asks the question, obviously they're, they're transparent and that's where it starts. Um, the owner and the, the key people are the ones that are in there and say, look, here it is. It's all out there. What do we need to do? Um, so yeah, it, it's doable. Um, and again, it's, it's. It just depends on the organization and what your commitment level is, um, but yeah. So I think the short answer is uh, you can reach out to Rudy and, uh, you know, hopefully he has enough time to, to uh, maybe you guys can work through some sort of engagement to help you design the laboratory. I, I think, uh, and I'll speak for Rudy on this, when, when you've retired in life and you want to share your your wisdom and experiences. The things that matter to a person are whether they enjoy working with the other group. Because there's no amount of money that makes it worth your while if the other group's a pain in the butt. And so uh, I just throw that out there. Like I, I, I really, I know Rudy was working with some, some laboratories before and it was more just out of personal interest to keep active and keep the mind sharp. And I'm very grateful that we've been able to take up all this time with you to, to help us out and, and uh, share in these webinars. And I also wanted the audience to respect that, that, you know, well, none of us are doing this to try and sell you things like consulting services. We're doing it because uh, we want to enjoy the people we hang out with. <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, return something to a community that has been generous to us. Is that? You know, you, you hit it right on the, the, the head. Um, it, 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 helping coach laboratories has been just a joy. It's, it's fun. Um, and yes, there are some people who, you know, I, I visited once and I, I, I don't go back uh, because they're not committed, but, but the vast majority um, it's just a joy. It is just a yeah. joy to sit down with these owners and managers and kind of just keep playing. I, I call it playing in the sandbox and really and truly to me, it's like playing in the sandbox. It's fun. It's enjoyable. And then of course, when you see the lights come on in someone, that's, that's beautiful. So yeah, yeah, you hit it right on the head. And uh, Sean's asking, yeah, this is exactly that. This is what Rudy does now in retirement. I'm a newbie to Rudy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Sean, it's actually not something Rudy does in retirement. I think he's more sitting in front of uh, a nice glass of red wine or or uh, hiking the El Camino Trail and so on. So uh, I, uh, I, I think it, it would be disrespectful for me to, to tell the whole world that, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to be a consultant in in your retirement, it's actually the other way around. We've had to co to cajole Rudy to, you know, uh, spend some time with us, and and really, I said to, to him, "You've got so much wisdom and experience to share the world. How can we do that and still be respectful of the fact that, you know, what you don't want to work that hard when you you've already done it all your life. You just want to share." the experiences and see people grow because that's the rewarding piece. And so, I mean, on that note, we've been trying to develop this board of experts for evident and Rudy has agreed to become one of our board of experts and along with other people that we're, we're bringing on board to really just share their wisdom with the, with the community. And what we're trying to figure out now is how to take Rudy's knowledge, put it in a, in a package that, uh, 
you know, when people are on, on uh, their benches or on their software, they can actually pull these reports out and, and then be able to maybe reach out to Rudy on chat or on video and ask him questions here and there as they, they make these transformations. So we're excited to offer that up to, to the community. We, we, we're still working through how we're going to offer it up because uh, we're building the, the boat as we go along, but uh, it's certainly been very helpful for me, Rudy. I really appreciate all the help you've given us. That's great. Yeah, so on that note, guys, we're at the top of the hour. So uh, thanks again for your time, Rudy, and for everyone here. I know we switched it up. It's a Wednesday today. We're also testing what dates and times are the best for, for everyone on this webinar. And uh, for all those people who ask questions, thanks for participating. So Sean, Jeff Strong, Tim, everyone else. So good to see you guys and take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.